They had indeed been searching books for Flamel's name ever since Hagrid had let it slip, because how else were they going to find out what Snape was trying to steal? The trouble was, it was very hard to know where to begin, not knowing what Flamel might have done to get himself into a book. He wasn't in Great Wizards of the 20th Century or Notable Magical Names of Our Time. He was missing too from important modern magical discoveries and a study of recent developments in wizardry. And then, of course, there was the sheer size of the library. Tens of thousands of books, thousands of shelves, hundreds of narrow rows. Hermione took out a list of subjects and titles she had decided to search while Ron strode off down a row of books and started pulling them off the shelves at random. In Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Harry, Ron and Hermione spend a bunch of time, months, looking for information about Nicholas Flamel. Here's a quick refresher on why. The trio know that something important has been hidden at Hogwarts to keep it safe. They're also pretty sure that Professor Snape is trying to steal the whatever it is. The staff of Hogwarts, including Hagrid, have helped to secure the thing in a third floor corridor. When they question Hagrid about it, he accidentally drops the name Nicholas Flamel into the conversation. You shouldn't have said that. I should not have said that. This immediately sparks Harry's interest because he's sure he's read that name somewhere before. And so begins their fruitless search of the library to find who Nicholas Flamel is. But they can't find anything. And I think I know why. The search is just too narrow in two different ways. Firstly, they're looking at stuff that's just too recent, too new. I mean, look at some of these titles. Great Wizards of the 20th Century. Notable Magical Names of Our Time. Important Modern Magical Discoveries. A study of recent developments in wizardry. They don't even consider looking at earlier stuff. When they do eventually find out who Flamel is, the information is in an enormous old book that gives his age as 665. We don't know what this book is or how old it is, but I think it's safe to say that Flamel made his Philosopher's Stone at least 600 years before Harry started attending Hogwarts. The second way the trio search is too narrow is in their subject terms. They appear to be looking mostly at wizarding sources rather than alchemical. Now, while Flamel might have been a wizard in the Harry Potter universe, in this universe, and yes, Flamel is a real historical person, he was best known for his alchemical practices, for being an alchemist. Now, I think the trio's assumptions on where to start their search are totally valid. I think starting relatively recent and within the scope of the wizarding subject, absolutely fine, perfect places to start your search. I mean, consider what they've got to go on. They've got Flamel's name and his connection to Dumbledore. So they assumed, and I think reasonably so, that Dumbledore and Flamel were contemporaries, when in fact, Dumbledore is some 500 years younger than Flamel, at least. The problem is that when their search didn't turn up anything useful, they should have started to question those assumptions and broaden their search criteria, either go for more subject terms or a deeper timeline. Instead, they kind of went around in circles. But hey, they're 11, so let's cut them some slack. In a previous video, I talked about how the Hogwarts School Library might have organized their collection, how they categorized the books and the scrolls and the manuscripts that they hold. Today, I wanna to use Harry, Ron and Hermione's failure to explore how staff and students at the Hogwarts School Library might find what they want. I mean, yes, you could just say Axio book, but that may not be the best idea. I recently visited the State Library of Victoria to have a look at their card catalogue. These are what we used to use before the internet came along to pretty much find anything we wanted 
at the library. It's called a card catalogue because it uses these handwritten or typed system cards or index cards. Now the State Library has four different kinds of cards. Author cards, title cards, subject cards and see also cards. These cards could cross-reference each other and library users could look up specific subjects, authors or titles to find books and location numbers. Now I'm going to assume that Hermione looked up Nicholas Flamel as an author, a title and a subject and didn't find anything. But I bet if she'd looked up Philosopher's Stone as a subject, she would have found at least something. But how would she know to look up Philosopher's Stone? So let's have a look at how these cards actually work. Let's say it's 1991. We're at our huge magical school library with tens of thousands of books spread out over thousands of shelves. We've got an assignment about werewolves for defense against the dark arts. In the middle of the main room of the library sits a long wooden cabinet with hundreds of small drawers on either side. This is the card catalog. Each drawer has a combination of letters on the front. Things like AAB to ADE or WAB to WEA. These are the ranges of letters in alphabetical order that each draw holds. We're looking for information about werewolves, so we'll start with the word werewolves. When it's written out, it starts with WER, so we'll go to the W drawers, then find the WE drawers, and then the drawer that holds WER. That might not be on the front of the drawer, and in this example, it's in the WEB to WEV drawer, because R is between B and V. Then we'd open the drawer and look through the hundreds of cards sorted alphabetically inside to find subject cards that say werewolves. And there it is, one card that has werewolves written across the top. The only problem is that instead of listing books or authors or even a shelf location, it says this, werewolves, see lycanthropy. So we sigh. <sighs> And we'll close the drawer and then repeat the same process for LYC to find the right drawer and the right cards. And there are a bunch of cards in this part of the catalogue. Each one has lycanthropy across the top and they all have a book underneath that. We'll have a look through those and make a note of the titles and shelf locations we want to look at. Later, let's say we've been recommended to look at the works of a particular author for charms. In this case, we'd repeat the same process we did for werewolves, looking for the drawer that has the first three letters of the author's name. Then we'd sort through the cards to find the whole name. There might be one card for that author, or there might be several, depending on how many books by that author the library has. Each card with the author's name at the top will have a different book with the call number and publication information. In the non-magical world, each of these cards has to be either handwritten or typed by a person and then filed and then checked to make sure that they're in the right order. This is a really slow and painful process. In magical libraries, I imagine they have a few tricks, spells, incantations to help this process along, to automate most of it. I'm imagining self-filling index cards cards that fill out their own information or self-filing cards even where they sort themselves into the right rows or one drawer that's infinitely long and holds all the cards for that library or uh, cards that maybe respond to verbal commands or cards when you say, I want this book to it, the book appears in your hand somehow by magic. I'm getting distracted, never mind. The card catalog is how I learned to find books when I was a kid. Today, in 2018, I'm 32, so this was not that long ago that card catalogues were the way to go, the only way to find what you were looking for in a library. The problem is you had to have a pretty decent idea of what you were looking for in the first place. And this is why Harry, Hermione and Ron really struggled. They didn't know what they were looking for beyond Flamel's name. <sighs> if they'd only asked... Irma Pince, or Madame Pince, the librarian at Hogwarts at the time, she probably could have helped them. They would have had a lot more success. 
but Harry didn't trust her. And that is an issue that I am not going to get into here. Maybe in another video. Going through all of this, exploring the Hogwarts library and visiting the State Library of Victoria to look at their card catalogue, I've gained a much deeper appreciation of what modern computerized catalogues can do, especially open publicly accessible catalogues or OPACs. With things like full text indexing where every single word in a document is searchable or remote searching where you don't even have to be at the library, you can do that online or things like Boolean searching or filters or subject suggestions that come up based on previous searches. OPACs are far more usable and accessible than card catalogues ever could be. However, most electronics don't work at Hogwarts. There's too much magical interference. So this is my best guess as to how Madame Pince and the librarians at Hogwarts before and after her made information available and accessible to the staff and students. I hope you've enjoyed this exploration of the Hogwarts School Library and the brief history lesson from the tour at the State Library of Victoria. So now I have a question for you. What would you like to see explored? What burning questions about libraries or information do you have that you'd like to see answered? Let me know and I might make it into a video. Thank you so much for watching.